Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels 1892 English Edition Introduction The present little book is, originally, part of a larger whole. About 1875, Dr. E. Döring, Preva Dassault, a university lecturer who formerly received fees from his students rather than a wage, at Berlin University, suddenly and rather clamorously announced his conversion to socialism and presented the German public not only with an elaborate socialist theory, but also with a complete practical plan for the reorganization of society. As a matter of course, he fell foul of his predecessors. Above all, he honored Marx by pouring out upon him the full vials of his wrath. This took place about the same time when the two sections of the Socialist Party in Germany, Eisenachers and Lassalians, had just effected that fusion at the Gotha Unification Congress, and thus attained not only an immense increase of strength, but what was more, the faculty of employing the whole of this strength against the common enemy. The Socialist Party in Germany was fast becoming a power, but to make it a power, the first condition was that the newly conquered unity should not be imperiled. And Dr. During openly proceeded to form around himself a sect, the nucleus of a future separate party. It thus became necessary to take up the gauntlet thrown down to us, and to fight out the struggle, whether we liked it or not. This, however, though it may not be an over-difficult, was evidently a long-winded business. As is well known, we Germans are of a terribly ponderous Grundlichkeit, or radical profoundity, or profound radicality, whatever you may like to call it. Whenever any of us expounds what he considers a new doctrine, he has first to elaborate it in all, into an old compromising system. He has to prove that both the first principles of logic and the fundamental laws of the universe had existed from all eternity for no other purpose than to ultimately lead to this newly discovered crowning theory. And Dr. During, in this respect, was quite up to the national mark. Nothing less than a complete system of philosophy. Mental, more natural, and historical. A complete system of political economy and socialism. And finally, a, crit a critical history of political economy. Three big volumes in octavo, heavily in extrinsic intrinsically and intrinsically. Three army corps of arguments mobilized against all previous philosophers and economists in general. And against Marx in particular. In fact, an attempt at a complete revolution in science. These were what I should have to tackle. 
I had to treat all of all and every possible subject, from concepts of time and space to bimetallism, from the etern eternity of matter and motion to the per perishable nature of moral ideas, from Darwin's natural selection to the education of youth and a future society. Anyhow, the systematic comprehensiveness of my opponent gave me the opportunity of developing, in opposition to him, and in more in a more connected form that than had previously been done. The views held by Marx and myself on this great variety of subjects, and that was the principal reason which made me undertake this otherwise ungrateful task. My reply was first published in a series of articles in the Leps Leipzig Vorwart. Orvats, the chief organ of the Socialist Party, and later on as a book. Here again, Durings Umvlasung der Wissenschaft. From Mr. E. Durings Revolution in Science, and the second edition of which appeared in Zurich, 1886, Anno At the request of my friend, Paul Lafargue, now representative of L'Elle in the French Chamber of Deputies, I arranged three chapters of this book as a pamphlet, which he translated and published in 1880 under the title Socialisme Utopique et Socialisme Scientifique. From this French text, from this French text, a Polish and a Spanish edition were prepared. In 1883, our German friends brought out the pamphlet in the original language, Italian, Russian, Danish, Deutsch, and Romanian translations based upon the German text, have since been published. Thus, the present English edition, this little book circulates in ten languages, I am not aware that any other socialist work, not even our Communist Manifesto of 1848 or Marxist Capital, has been so often translated. And Germany has f had four editions of about 20,000 copies in all. The Appendix the mark was written with the intention of spreading among the German Socialist Party some elementary knowledge of the history and development of landed property in Germany. This seemed all the more necessary at a time when the assimilation by that party of the working people of the towns was in a fair way of completion, and when the agricultural laborers and peasants had to be taken in hand. This impending has been included in the translation, and the original forms of tenure of land common to all Teutonic tribes, and the history of their decay are even less known in England and in Germany. I have left the text as it stands in the original, without alluding to the hypotheses recently stated by Maxim Kowalewski according to which the partition of the arable and meadow lands among the members of the mark was preceded by their being cultivated for joint account by a large patriarchal family community, embracing several generations, as exemplified by the still existing South Slavonian Zadruga, and that the partition later on took place when the community had increased so as to become too unwieldy for joint account management. Kowalewski is probably quite right, and the matter is still sub judice, or under consideration. The economic terms in this work, as far as they are new, agree with those used in the English edition of Marx's Capital. We call production of commodities that economic phase where articles are produced not only for the use of the producers, but also for the purpose of exchange. It is as commodities 
not as use values. This phase extends from the first beginnings of production for exchange down to our present time, and attains its full development under capitalist production only. It is under conditions where the capitalist, the owner of the means of production, employees for wages, laborers, people deprived of all means of production except their own labor power, and pockets the excess of the selling price of the products over his outlay. We divide the history of industrial production since the Middle Ages into three periods. Handicraft, small master craftsmen with a few journeymen and apprentices where each laborer produces a complete article. Manufacture, where a great numbers of workmen grouped in one large establishment produce the complete article on the principle of division of labor, each workman performing only one partial operation so that the product is complete only after having passed successfully through the hands of all. Modern in industry, where the product is produced by machinery driven by power and where the work of the laborer is limited to superintending and correcting the performance of the mechanical agent. I am perfectly aware that the contents of this work will meet with objection from a considerable portion of the British public, but if we continentals had taken the slightest notice of the prejudices of British respectability, we should be even worse off than we are. This book defends what we call historical materialism, and the word materialism grates upon the ears of the immense majority of British readers. Agnosticism might be tolerated, but materialism is utterly inadmissible. And yet the original home of all modern materialism from the 17th century onwards is England. Materialism is the natural born son of Great Britain. Already the British schoolman Don Scotus asked whether it was impossible for the matter to think. In order to effect this miracle, he took refuge in God's omnipotence. It is, he made theology preach materialism. Moreover, he was a nominalist. Nominalism, the first form of materialism, is chiefly found among the English schoolmen. The real progenitor of English materialism is Bacon. To him, natural philosophy is the only true philosophy, and physics, based upon the experience of the senses, is the chiefest part of natural philosophy. Anazagoras and his Homion Maria, Namakritus and his Atoms, he often quotes as his authorities. According to him, the senses are infallible and the source of all knowledge. All science is based upon experience and consists in subjecting the data furnished by the senses to a rational method of investigation, induction, analysis, comparison, observation, experiment, and the principal forms of such a rational method. Among the qualities inherent in matter, motion is the first and foremost, not only in the form of mechanical and mathematical motion, but chiefly in the form of an impulse, a vital spirit attention, or a qual, to use a term of Jacob Bohm's of Mator. In Bacon's, in Bacon, its first creator, materialism still occludes within itself the germs of a many-sided development. On the one hand, matter surrounded by a sensuous poetic glamour seems to attract men's whole entity by winning smiles. On the other hand, the aphoristically formulated doctrine pollutes 
of inconsistencies in parted from theology. In further evolution, materialism became becomes one-sided. Hobbes is the man who systematizes Baconian materialism. Knowledge based upon the senses loses its poetic blossom. It passes into the abstract experience of the mathematician. Geometry is proclaimed as the queen of sciences. Materialism takes to misanthropy. It is to overcome its opponent. Misanthropic flashless spiritualism and that on the latter's own ground materialism has to chastise its own flesh and turn ascetic thus for from a sensual it passes into an intellectual entity but thus too it involves only consistency regardless of consequences characteristic of the intellect. Hobbes as Bacon's continuator argues th thus, if all human knowledge is finished by the senses, then our concepts and ideas are but the phantoms divested of their own sensuous, sensual forms of the real world. Philosophy can give but names to these phantoms. One name may be applied to more than one of them. There may even be names of names. It would imply a contradiction if, on the one hand, we maintain that all ideas had their origin in the world of sensation, and on the other hand, that a world was more than a word. That, besides the beings known to us, by our senses, beings which are one and all individuals, there existed also beings of a general and individual nature, an unbodily substance is the same absurdity as an unbodily body, body being substance, are but different terms for the same reality. It is impossible to separate thought from matter that thinks. This matter is a sub substratum of all f changes going on in the world. The world infinite, the word infinite is meaningless unless it states that our mind is capable of performing an endless process of addition. Only material things being perceptible to us, we cannot know anything but about the existence of God. My own existence alone is certain. Every human passion is mechanical movement, which has a beginning and an end. The objects of impulse are what we call good. Man is subject to the same laws as nature. Power and freedom are identical. Hobbes has systematized Bacon, without, however, furnishing a proof for Bacon's fundamentals principle. The origin of all human knowledge from the world of sensation. It was like who, in the in his essay on human understanding, supplied this proof. Hobbes had shattered the theistic prejudices of Baconian materialism. Collins, Dodwell, Carwell, Hardwell, Hartley, Priestele similarly shattered the last theological bars that still hemmed in Locke's sensationalism. At all events, for practical materialist, theism is but an easy-going way of getting rid of religion. Karl Marx, The Holy Family, pages 201 to 204. <laughs> Thus, Karl Marx wrote about the British origin of modern materialism. If English men nowadays do not exactly relish the compliment he paid their ex ancestors, more is a pity. It is nonetheless undeniable that Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke are the fathers of that brilliant school of French materialism which made the 18th century. In spite of all the battles on land and sea won over, Fren over Frenchmen by Germans and Englishmen, a preeminently French century, even before that crowning French Revolution, the results of which we outsiders in England as well as Germany are still trying to acclimatize, there is no denying it. About the middle of the century, what struck every cultivated, cultivated foreigner who set up 
his residence in England, was what he was then bound to consider the religious bigotry and the stupidity, and the stupidity of the English respectable middle class. We at the time, at that time, were all materialists, or at least very advanced free thinkers, and to us it appeared inconceivable that almost all educated people in England should believe in all sorts of impossible miracles, and that even geo geologists like Buckland and Mattel should contort the facts of their science so as not to, not to clash too much with the myths of the book of Genesis, in order to find people who dare to use their own intellectual faculties with regard to religious matters. You had to go amongst the educated, the great unwashed, as they were called, the working people, especially the Owenite socialists. But England had been civilized since then. The expedition of 1851 sounded the knell of English insular exclusiveness. England became gradually internationalized and died in matters and ideas, so much so that I began to wish that some English manners and customs had made as much headway on the continent as other continental habits have made here. Anyhow, the introduction and spread of salad oil before 1850, 1851, known only to the aristocracy, has been accompanied by a vital spread of continental skepticism in matters religious. It has come to this that agnosticism, though not yet considered the thing, quite as much as the Church of England, is yet very nearly on a par, as far as respectability goes, with baptism, and decidedly ranks above the Salvation Army. And I cannot help believing that under those circumstances it will be consoling to many who sincerely regret and condemn this progress of infant Fidelity to learn that these new fangled notions are not of foreign origin, are not made in Germany like so many other articles of daily use, but are undoubtedly Old English, and their British originators two hundred years ago. With a good deal further than their descendants now dare to venture. What indeed is an agnosticism but to use an expressive Lincolnshire term, shame-faced materialism? The agnostic's conception of nature is materialistic throughout. The entire natural world is governed by law and absolutely excludes the intervention of action from without. But he adds, we have no means either of ascertaining or of disproving uh, the existence of some supreme being beyond the known universe. That is my hope, good. At the time when Laplace, to Napoleon's question, why in the great astronomers, the taste and celestial mechanics, the creator was not even mentioned. Proudly replied, I had no need of this <coughs> hypothesis. But nowadays, in our evolutionary conception of the universe, there is absolutely no room for either a creator or a ruler. And the talk of a supreme being shut out from the whole existing world implies a contradiction in terms, as it seems to me, and Jane. A gratuitous insult to the feelings of religious people. Again, our agnostic admits that all our knowledge is based upon the information impacted to us by our senses. But he adds, how do we know that our senses gives us correct representations of the objects we, we perceive through them? 
and he proceeds to inform us that whenever we speak of objects or their qualities of which he cannot know any firm for certain but merely impressions which they have produced on his senses now this line of reasoning seems undoubtedly hard to beat by mere argumentation but before there was argumentation there was action and im arfang war die that from Goethe's Faust in the beginning was the deed and human action had solved the difficulty long before human ingenuity invented it the proof of the pudding is the is in the eating from the moment we turn to our own use these objects according to the qualities we perceive in them we put to an infallible test the correctness of other ways of our sense perception and these perceptions have been wrong then our estimate of the use to which an object can be turned must also be wrong and our attempt must fail but if we succeed in accomplishing our aim if we find that the object does agree with our idea of it and does answer the purpose we intended it for then that is proof positive that our perceptions of it and its qualities so far agree with reality outside ourselves and whenever we find ourselves face to face with its with a failure then we generally are not long in making out the cause that made us fail we find that the perception upon which we acted was either incomplete and superficial or combined with the results of other perceptions in a way not warranted by them what we call defective reasoning so long as we take care to train our senses properly and to keep our action within the limits prescribed by perceptions properly made and properly used so long as we shall find that the result of our action proves the conformity of our perceptions with the objective nature of the things perceived not in one single instance so far have we led to the conclusion that our sense of perception scientifically controlled induce in our minds ideas respecting the outer world that are by their very nature at variance with reality or that there is an inherent incompatibility between the outer world and our sub perceptions of it but then come the neo-kantian agnostics and say we may correctly perceive the qualities of a thing, but we cannot by any sensible or mental process grasp the thing in itself. This thing in itself, das thing, is beyond our ken. To this Hegel, long since, has replied, If you know all the qualities of a thing, you know the thing itself. Nothing remains but that the fact that the said thing exists without us and when your senses have taught you that fact you have grasped grasped the last remnant of the thing in itself Kant's celebrated unknowable thing an sich or thing an sich to which it may be added that in Kant's time our knowledge of natural objects was indeed so fragmentary that he might well suspect behind a little we knew about each of them a mysterious ding and sich but one after another these ungraspable things have been grasped analyzed and what is more reproduced by the giant progress of science and what we can produce we certainly cannot consider as unknowable that the chemistry of the first half of this, this century organic substances were such mysterious object now we learn to build them up one after another from their chemical elements without the aid of organic processes modern chemists declare that as soon as the chemical constitution of no matter what body is known it can be built up from the from its elements 
we are still far from knowing the constitution of the highest organic substances, the albuminous bodies. But there is no reason why we should not, if only after centuries arrive at the knowledge and, armed with it, produce artificial albumum. But if we arrive at that, we shall at the same time have produced organic life for life from, from its lowest to its highest forms. It is but the moral, but it is the normal mode of existence of albuminous bodies. As soon, however, as our agnostic has made these formal mental reservations, he tucks in X, and as a rank materialist, materialist he a bomb is. He may say that, as far as we know, matter and motion, or as it is now called energy, can neither be created nor destroyed, but that we have no proof of their not having been created at some time or another. But if you can try to use this omission against him in any particular case, he will quickly put you out of court. If he admits the possibility of spiritualism and abstracto, he will have none of it in, in concreto. As far as we know, and can know, he will tell you there is no creator and no ruler of the universe. As far as we are concerned, matter and energy can neither be created nor annihilated. For us, mind is a mode of energy, a function of the brain. All we know is that the material world is governed by immutable laws, and so forth. Thus, as far as he is a scientific man, and as far as he knows anything, he is a materialist. Outside his science and spheres about which he knows nothing, he translates his ignorance into Greek and calls it agnosticism. At all events, one thing seems clear. Even if I was an agnostic, it is evident that I could not describe the conception of history sketched out in this little book as historical as an ag agnosticism. Religious people would laugh at me, and Gnostics would indignantly ask, was I making fun of them? And thus, I hope even British respectability will not be overshocked if I use, in English as well as many other languages, the term historical materialism to designate the, that view of the course of history which seeks the ultimate cause and the great moving power of all important historic events in the economic development of society, in the changes in the modes of production and exchange, and the consequent division of society into distinct classes, and as a struggle of these classes against one another. This indulgence will perhaps be accorded to me all the sooner if I show that historical materialism may be of the advantage even to British respectability. I have mentioned the fact that, about 40 to 50 years ago, any cultivated foreigner settling in England was struck by what he was then bound to consider a religious bigotry and stupidity of the English respectable middle class. I am now going to prove that the respectable English middle class of that time was not quite as stupid as it looked to the intelligent foreigner. Its religious leanings can be explained.